morning, good morning. It is a Tuesday, um, oh, no, October. It's not October, it's August the 18th. I can't see my calendar. Um, and we are live on both Facebook and on Instagram for another episode of First Chapter Fun. My name is Hannah Mary McKinnon, and this is the place where twice a week, every Tuesday and Thursday, Hank Philippi Ryan, my fictional partner in crime, and myself read the first chapter of a different book, not ours, live on both platforms. So if this is the first time you have joined First Chapter Fun, well, let me tell you, this is episode, I had to check there, this is episode number 82. That's right, 82, number 82, which is crazy really. So this is something that started back in March when COVID hit and I was panicking and I offered to some of my author friends to read the, the first chapter of their books live on Instagram here on my phone and Facebook on my desktop and I thought maybe you know half a dozen people would agree to this madness and it turned out to be 53 days in a row until Hank Philippi Ryan and I joined forces and ever since May 12th we've been reading twice a week the days with a T, and here we are, episode number 82. So Brad, Brad from Audio Shelf, if you have not discovered Audio Shelf, please, please do yourselves a favor, go and check them out on both Instagram and on Facebook. Brad and Brittany do these brilliant videos they're on YouTube as well, and they're absolutely fantastic. And Brad says 82, O-M-G-G-G-G-G. Yes, 82, I can't believe it. Good morning, Shannon and Susan and Daisy and Hank, of course, on Facebook and Ali. Um, and Brad says, been an OG chapter first subscriber. <laughs> Love this. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Um, Linda is saying strangely that she can't find me on Facebook now. I hope I'm still on Facebook. It says I am. If somebody's Hank dropped me a, a, a quick text. Glenny's just um, text, uh, texted commented oh my gosh too many too many words uh we have tracy we have michelle oh michelle just says just want to tell you that i devoured sister dear that's my fourth novel thank you um so i had to order your others that is so kind thank you very very much i tell you what i'm gonna i want to show you something um want to share this with with everybody first chapter fun has become such a fun community which which as i mentioned off the top it just started really on a, on on a whim this 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 half serious comment that i made about um reading live and i came home on saturday 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 or sunday i'm losing track of the days i tell you i went out with uh, my son who's leo who's about to take his um drivers test next week and he drove me around to nine little free libraries in Oakville and I dropped off a copy of Sister Deer in each of them and took photographs and if you live in the area you might still find one. So I came home and Rob, my husband, said there's a package for you on the, uh, there was something on the doorstep. I said, oh, that, that's weird. It wasn't from, from Amazon or any of the usual suspects. It wasn't a book. Shock horror. What? Not a book? What is this madness? And I opened up these two parcels and look what I received. A first chapter fun mug, hand made or hand decorated with the dates of the original. So it says from March 17th to May the 8th. Those were the daily episodes, look at that. And then this sign, I hope you can, yes, you can see that. It says first chapter fun. I know it's back to front on Instagram because Instagram's silly but on Facebook. Fix that Instagram, will you? Look at that. Isn't that neat? Isn't that, that is just so sweet. And these were from Judy Rose, who is watching now and to whom I have to say thank you again. It was with a, with a little note, with a little, little heart cut out. You see that there? Um, and she said, hi, Hannah, here are some mementos for you to commemorate your awesome idea of first chapter fun. And for reading every single day, I enjoyed the first chapter. Sincerely, Judy Rose. Judy Rose, you absolutely made our day. That was just so sweet and so special. And I love this community that we're building. I think on Facebook, there are um, almost 1,500 members now, almost 500 on Instagram. 
Um, so tell your friends because it's a fun place to be. You can always watch the videos later. They are always saved in our archive on IGTV, on Instagram and in our um, videos in the media section on the new Facebook. So you can always go back and watch whichever videos you have missed. And Judy Rose, that was just such a lovely thing to do. Thank you very, very much. Now, before I introduce you to today's book, quick shout out to Jenny Milchman because The Second Mother publishes today her latest novel. And we read from that one on First Chapter Fun. I think it was July 7th. So you will find that in our archive. Not now. Don't go and look now, but make a note and go and listen to that one. It is sitting pretty on my Kindle, waiting to be devoured. So congratulations, Jenny, on another stellar novel. So today's book, New York Times best-selling author, oh yes, is Deborah Crombie's A Bitter Feast. Here we go. I hope you can see it. Yes, you can see that. Always a bit tricky sometimes with the uh, with the light. But this is the book that I can introduce you to today. Um, a Bitter Feast by Deborah Crombie. And it says right at the top, New York Times best-selling author. And she is watching. She is with us. I see she has said hi, everyone, on Instagram. Uh, seeing lots and lots of comments as well on on Facebook too. So because Deborah's here, you can ask her questions. Quick note to the wise on Instagram, once we transfer it to our feed, the comments disappear, but not on Facebook. So if you have a burning question on Instagram, ask Deborah right now. Um, and otherwise on Facebook, you can you can take more time and, and, and leave them. But all of the answers and messages, it's silly, really, but they do just disappear. I don't know why. Fix that too, Instagram. Come on. So I'm going to turn the volume off here because I have some messages coming in, which is really quite funny. Um, let me introduce you to Deborah Crombie, author of A Bitter Feast. She's written a few books. Just a few, you know, putting me with my five novels to shame. But let me tell you a little bit about Deborah, and I need my glasses for this. Um, all right, here we go. New York Times best-selling author Deborah Crombie is a native Texan who thinks she was born on the wrong side of the pond. Although she lives in Texas, her crime novels are set in the United Kingdom. Her Duncan Kincaid, Gemma James series has received numerous awards, including Edgar, McCavity and Agatha nominations, and is published in more than a dozen countries to international acclaim. Deborah lives in North Texas with her husband, German shepherds and cats, and divides her time between Texas and Great Britain. Her latest book, A Bitter Feast, is available from William Morrow. That's part of HarperCollins, an imprint of HarperCollins. She is currently working on her 19th Kincaid James novel. So just like First Chapter Fun, if you are just discovering Deborah's books today, well, you have 17 others to go and read. So plenty to keep you busy. No excuses there. You will never be bored ever again. So this is the novel that we are um, reading from today. And I just saw a message from Susan. Would it be too difficult to compile a list of all books and authors read to date? I think I have caught most of them. No, it actually wouldn't. That's, that's a good idea. So I'm going to make a note of that. Hold on. Chat amongst yourselves for all of 30 seconds. Not even maybe 10 um, and I'm and we can we can work on that you're right because that way you can all already see directly and I did that for the first readings I had a I had an entire list so let's see let's see what we can do um, and Deborah is now watching on Facebook as well so this is wonderful all right um, great question Frank and all good in any order so um, Deborah can we read these in any order or do they need to be read? Oh, yeah. She said, yes, Hank, any old way is fine. Fantastic. So let me now introduce you to A Bitter Feast. Scotland Yard Detective Superintendent Duncan Kincaid and his wife, Detective Inspector Gemma James, have been invited for a relaxing weekend in the Cotswolds 
one of Britain's most enchanting regions, famous for its rolling hills, golden cottages and picturesque villages. Side note, I've been there and it is absolutely gorgeous. One of my favourite places, a bit like the Lake District is also one of my favourite places. Just beautiful. Duncan, Gemma and their children are guests at Beck House, the family estate of Melody Talbot, Gemma's detective sergeant. The Talbot family is wealthy, prominent and powerful. Melody's father is the publisher of one of London's largest and most influential newspapers. The centrepiece of this glorious fall getaway is a posh charity harvest luncheon catered by up-and-coming chef Viv Holland. After 15 years in London's cutthroat food scene, Viv has returned to the Gloucestershire valleys of her childhood and quickly made a name for herself with her innovative meals based on traditional cuisine but using fresh local ingredients. Attended by the local well-to-do, as well as national press food bloggers and restaurants critics, the event could make Viv a star. But a tragic car accident and a series of mysterious deaths rock the estate and pull Duncan and Gemma into the investigation. It soon becomes clear that the killer has a connection with Viv's pub, or perhaps with Beck House itself. Does the truth lie in the past? Or is it closer to home, tied up in the tangled relationships and bitter resentments between the staff at Beck House and Viv's new pub? Or is it a more personal, entwined, or is it more personal, entwined with secrets hidden by Viv and those closest to her? Pub date was 8th of October 2019, so you can get your hands on all of Deborah's books right now, including this one. And of course, as always, we read with the permission of Deborah and her publisher, William Morrow, which is an imprint of HarperCollins. And before I forget, um, if I get booted on any of the platforms, please uh, stick with me because it's not you, it's me or Facebook. Or Instagram and I will come back to the platform that chucked me out but fingers crossed I haven't jinxed it now I've said that I always worry about that so without further ado let me show you the smashing cover again of a bitter feast and there we go by Deborah Crombie now sit back relax and I will read you part of chapter one She'd never been much of a sleeper. A good thing, she supposed, since getting by with little of it was a major requirement for a cook. That morning, she'd been up well before the September dawn. She'd made the farm runs, picking up the day's fresh veg for the pub. Then, home again, she'd made breakfast for her 11-year-old daughter, Grace, before taking her to school. She treasured those quiet mornings with her daughter, Often it was the only time they managed to spend together outside of the restaurant kitchen. Her brief hour on her own in the pub kitchen before the staff arrived for lunch service was priceless as well, and today doubly so. She'd scrubbed the walk-in fridge, organised the supplies, handwritten the day's menu for beer, her manager to copy. Now, apron clad, she sat on the kitchen's back step, looking out over the little service area between the pub and the cottage that was the chef's attached accommodation. Sipping her first espresso of the day from the pub's machine, she ran over her to-do list for tomorrow's charity luncheon at Beck House, the Talbot's place. Sudden doubt assailed her. What had she been thinking to commit to such a thing, catering an outdoor lunch for four dozen of the local well-to-do, as well as national bloggers and restaurant critics? When she'd come here with Grace three years ago, glad of a regular job that put a roof over their heads and food in her daughter's mouth, she'd sworn to keep it simple. Good pub food, pies, fish and chips, seasonal soups, a Sunday roast lunch. She had done that, and done it well, judging by the daily packed house. Why then? Had she let herself be seduced into stretching past those self-imposed boundaries? Something memorable, Viv. Something only you can do. 
Lady Adelaide had said with utter breezy confidence, and she'd taken the bait. Well, she was in for it now, regardless, and she couldn't stop the little fizz of excitement in her veins. Everything, from starter to pudding, was made with local produce, and she'd spent weeks refining the menu. That morning, she'd already pre prepped the pub smoker, a poor man's Camado Joe, and put in one last lamb shoulder. Over the past few weeks, she'd cooked and frozen more than half a dozen joints, but last night, in an attack of panic, she'd decided to do one more. The white beans with fennel that would accompany the meat had also been cooked and frozen, and were now defrosting in the cottage kitchen. She had a few things to finish up that afternoon, and a few that could only be done tomorrow morning, but Overall, she thought she was in good shape. Taking a last sip of her coffee, she gazed absently beyond the mellow Cotswold stone of the storage shed and adjoining cottage to the hills rising away from the gentle valley of the River Eye. This was her favourite time of year, early autumn. Had been since she was a child, growing up in these same Gloucestershire valleys. She'd never thought, after 15 years in London, that she'd end up back here. But maybe it was a good thing, and maybe the charity lunch would be a good thing too. She'd certainly paid her dues the last few years between catering jobs and the pub. And if she were totally honest, she missed the buzz of the bigger food world. Maybe it was time she stuck a toe back in those waters. What harm could it do after all this time? She tipped the dregs of her cup into the potted geranium by the back door. On with it then, and let tomorrow bring what it would. She was pushing herself up from the step when a tall shadow fell across the yard, blocking the morning sun, and when she looked up, her heart nearly stopped. Nell Green pushed a few bites of chicken and tarragon pie about on her plate. You could always count on the pubs made from scratch pies. Chef Viv's short crust pastry was divine and a cold snap in the late September weather had made Nell crave that sort of starchy comfort. The pub's open fire beckoned as well, so she'd taken a seat in the bar near the hearth rather than in the more formal dining areas on either side of the cosy centre room. But she'd felt odd alone in the midst of the Friday night bustle and had toyed with her food as she watched the evening sun slant through the pub's mullioned windows. Since her divorce she'd found that she quite liked living on her own but she had not got used to dining alone in public places. Watching couples always made her feel more awkward and the sight of the two middle-aged and obviously married couples chatting over gins and newspapers brought a familiar twinge of jealousy. But tonight, the young man and the woman at the next table took the prize. They sat with their legs intertwined, kissing and nuzzling. When the blonde woman ran her hand up the inside of the le of, up the in man oh man, when the blonde woman ran her hand up inside the leg of the man's football shorts, Nell looked away, cringing with embarrassment. She suspected they were both married, but to other people. Nothing else would explain such a brazen display of, well, she supposed you could call it affection. At least she wasn't the only one alone tonight, she thought, glancing at the tall man in the fedora who had claimed the comfortably worn leather sofa in the corner. He was, she guessed, a good ten years younger than she, perhaps in his mid-forties, Beneath the brown hat, his unruly blonde hair curled to his shoulders. His beard, full but neatly trimmed, was a shade darker than his hair, but it failed to hide his strikingly deep dimples, visible when he'd smiled at the waitress. At first she thought he must be meeting someone, but a half hour had passed, and he was still alone. Now, as though sensing her notice, he glanced up. Raising his eyebrows in the direction of the snogging couple, he gave her a small conspiratorial smile. Blushing, Nell managed to nod back. Then, slowly and deliberately, the man winked at her before turning his attention back to his food. Nell felt mortified. Had he been mocking her? 
but there hadn't seemed any malice in his gesture, and after another moment spent nibbling at the remains of her pie, curiosity got the better of her, and she glanced his way again. What was such a good-looking man doing on his own in the village pub on a Friday evening? Strangers weren't unusual, as the village was a draw for tourists and holiday-makers, but you seldom saw someone unfamiliar on their own. Now he caught the barman's eye and touched his coffee cup. There was something in his manner that made her think he was used to getting what he wanted, and quickly. Well, why not? In spite of the slight eccentricity of the hat and the shoulder-length hair, his clothes were obviously expensive. Perhaps he was a guest at the posh manor house hotel in the village. Nell watched as Jack, the bar manager, brought a fresh coffee from the kitchen and whisked away the man's empty cup. Why only coffee? Nell wondered. Having found alcohol too easy a crutch in the early days of her divorce, she'd given it up except for the occasional social glass of wine. She no longer drank alone, and she felt a little more warmly disposed towards a fellow abstainer. She'd readied another smile when she saw that he was looking not at her, but towards the kitchen. Bea Abbott, the pub's business manager, came through the kitchen door at the back of the bar. With a murmured word to Jack, she came round the bar and crossed the room towards the exit leading to the pub's small garden. It was odd, thought Nell, that she didn't stop to speak to any of the customers. Bea, with her dark curly hair and rimless glasses, was usually efficiently chatty. In the corner, the man with the fedora watched the door close after Bea, then uncrossed his long legs and drummed his fingers on the table. His face was intent now, abstracted, and when his gaze passed over her, she knew she'd become invisible. Suddenly he set his coffee cup down with a click and stood. He strode across the room, going round the bar and through the kitchen door, without so much as a by your leave to Jack. Nell sat open-mouthed in surprise, but Jack merely frowned and went on wiping glasses with more force than necessary. The snogging couple got up and went out the car park door, still entwined. The dining rooms either side of the bar had begun to fill as Sarah, one of the two servers, showed arriving customers to their tables. But over the increasing hum of conversation, Nell heard rising voices from the kitchen. At first the voices were indistinct, then Viv Holland said quite clearly, you can't just waltz in here like this, demanding things. Who the hell do you think you are? Nell was surprised. She'd never heard Viv, the spikily blonde creator of the perfect pastry, raise her voice. There was an answering rumble, indecipherable. The man in the hat, Nell guessed. No, you can't, said Viv, her voice now high and furious. I won't do it. I told you. Viv, come on. Be reasonable, the man again, more clearly now, with a hint of cajoling. His accent, Nell decided, was Irish. Viv muttered something. Well, if you're going to be a stubborn cow, the man said, sounding less patient now, at least consider no. There was a crash, as if Viv had dropped something or thrown something. You have no bloody right, she said close to shouting. You have no bloody right to ask. Now get out. I mean it. Conversation had died in the bar as the other patrons turned wide-eyed towards the kitchen. Jack stood, his hand frozen on the beer pool. What on earth? wondered Nell, feeling terribly uncomfortable. What did the man want Viv to do? She'd been intending to speak to Viv about Lady Adelaide's harvest lunch tomorrow, but now she didn't want to intrude. The man came through the door into the bar, his expression grim. He pushed past Nell's table without a glance of acknowledgement and slammed his way out the garden door with a force that left it banging behind him. His camel hair coat remained behind, crumpled on the sofa. <gasps> Who is this guy indeed, Judy Rose just said. And she says, what is happening in the kitchen? Well, you're going to have to get your hands on A Bitter Feast by Deborah Crombie to find out. And this book, 
the 17th, 18th, dang it, I've got 18th in the series because Deborah is working on the 19th, is out now. So who is the dude? I can't say dude and get away with it, I'm too old. Who's the guy in the fedora? What does he want? What is going on? Well, we're all going to have to read the book to find out. So that was a super fun, it's kind of fun to try and do. I had to get a friend of mine to send me, I said to her, can you do a West Country accent? That was, I was trying to do a West Country accent for Viv and then an Irish one for the guy in the fedora. And I said, I can't do a West Country accent. Can you, I'm gonna send you two sentences, three sentences. Can you record them for me? So thank you, Becky, if you're watching this. <laughs> I hope I did an all right job. It's always good fun. Remember, remember, boys and girls, Hank and I are not audiobook pros. We we just, you know, so so I hope you are always pleased that you indulge us with the different accents and the reading and the stumbling and the fluffing of the lines. Um, once again, this was A Bitter Feast by Deborah Crombie. Such a fun book to read. And I don't know about you, but all of that talk of food, it is now five to 12 here and I'm hungry. So... <laughs> Let me tell you about um, Thursday's book. It's called, this is such, such a beautiful cover. It is by Jen McKinley, also a New York Times best-selling author. Oop. And it is called Paris is Always a Good Idea. I've been to Paris a couple of times and it was always a good idea. So <laughs> there you go. This is going to be Thursday's um read oh thank you very much deborah she says great accents and terrific job emily says you're a great reader hannah well that's very kind of you thank you very much and i think i spotted deborah saying that normally her uh, narrator for her books is oh yes here is, my usual audio narrator is male so fun to hear the book read by hannah that is so interesting that is so fun i'm gonna have to listen to them i love audio books Went out for a walk this morning, um, which I'm trying to do early every morning and just get out and go. Because I know once I sit down at my computer, I'm just dead. I'm not moving again. Um, not dead, obviously, but, you know, sucked into what I'm doing. So I'm trying to do that. And I always pop in an audiobook, and it's become my thing. I have this hour to myself and I can just go out and walk and listen to other people's work and other people telling me stories, which I just love. So let me show you those covers again. Today's read, I hope you enjoyed this episode. Deborah Crombie, A Bitter Feast. Don't forget to leave comments for Deborah. Uh, you have a couple of, about two minutes left on Instagram or a minute left um, and much more time on Facebook, of course. And Thursday at 11.30, we will be reading from Jen McKinley's Paris is Always a Good Idea. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope we'll see you again on Thursday or any other day with a tea, that's Tuesday or Thursday. And uh, until then, as always, please stay safe, stay kind, and we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you for watching.